I am joined here tonight by two of the world's leading climate scientists. Ken Caldera is a scientist working at the Carnegie Institution uh, Department of Global Ecology. He has written and he researched and published widely on climate, energy, and carbon. Uh, and he is a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. Noah Diffenbach is an associate professor in the School of Earth Sciences and senior fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for Environment. Um, he, his research interests are centered on the dynamics and impacts of climate variability and change, including human impacts on climate system. And he is also a lead author on uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. So thank you and welcome Ken and Noah. Uh, so we're in interesting times. There is a lot of uh, discussions about climate in the news. We've had lots of records, heat waves, st storms, wildfires, droughts, as we know here in California, which has brought elevated climate in the, uh, in the news media as well in the public mind. Uh, Obama has just come out and shown great leadership on climate issue in terms of uh, putting forth the uh, first power rules to regulate global warming pollution from the greatest, the largest single source of global warming pollution in the nation. And importantly, over the last year, in, uh, we've also had two authoritative scientific assessments of the knowledge of, uh, of what we know about the state of science, of climate science, about what's happening here in the nation and also wor worldwide. That's the National Climate Assessment as well as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. So there's lots of talk about tonight. We're gonna focus first on the state of the science, the state of the science of what we know here, and then pivot to what that tells us about um, how, how we might respond or how we should be responding to, uh, to the, the climate crisis. So before I turn to asking some questions specifically about IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for those of you who aren't in the weeds of this work uh, all the time, let me give you a little bit of context for the IPCC. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was an institution that was established about 25 years ago for, um, by the UN. And its goal, as quoted from its, uh, the website, the IPCC website, is to provide the world with a clear scientific view on the current state of knowledge in climate change and its potential impact there's been potential environmental and socio socioeconomic impacts. This year, the fifth report was released. Uh, this is uh, five, the fifth report at, of, um, over the last 25 years. Uh, and each of you were lead authors on this report, different sections of it. Um, so let me, and each of the reports over the years has sort of brought greater clarity, greater certainty to the risks that we see uh, from the, the change in climate. And each, each has always had a, one big message. Uh, let me turn to you, Noah, first and ask, what, what do you think the main message of this fifth assessment report is? Um, so I was involved in the working group two. Uh, so that, that's what I know most closely. And that's, that's focused on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. Um, and what we've really learned a lot over the last you know, seven years or so since the fourth assessment report about climate-related risks and how uh, particularly extreme events uh, in the physical climate system, like heat waves and floods and, and uh, severe thunderstorms, uh, how those, those uh, physical hazards intersect with uh, the exposure and vulnerability of people and, and uh, other living things to create climate risk. And so we know in the United States, for example, that uh, the likelihood of severe heat, heavy uh, rainfall, extreme storm surges, uh, extremely low snow years, uh, that these are all, the likelihood has been increasing uh, over recent decades and that uh, the likelihood is, is uh, we have high confidence that, that the likelihood of those extreme events will continue to increase as, as global warming continues. And because of the vulnerability of different natural and human systems in the current climate, uh, we've, we've learned a lot about, about the, um, the risk of, of uh, not only continued climate change, but also the, the climate change that's already occurred, the, the global warming that's already happened. So for me, I think the, the, the biggest message coming out of Working Group 2 is that uh, 
you know, global warming is increasing the risk of, of high impact climate change, uh, not only for further global warming, but also uh, in the climate that we have now. Well, Noah is uh, correct to emphasize what's new in the latest round of reports. It's also uh, important to recognize that a, a major conclusion of the most recent round of reports is that the findings of the earlier reports are fundamentally correct. And so that the, our knowledge of climate change is maturing. It's becoming a mature science. And so while we're adding to the pool of knowledge, we're not finding that the things we said earlier are wrong, that, that, that as more and more evidence has developed, the certainty and confidence in the basic results uh, are, are becoming uh, more, more uh, profound. Th that's not to say that there's not still substantial uncertainty on exactly what the outcomes will be, but, but the basic science is well established. So one of the, one of the key findings from my reading of, of the IPCC and the National Climate Assessment as well, um, compared to others, is that there's a real focus on uh, climate change is happening now. Um, and the earlier report certainly was focused on projections towards the end of the century. As we sit here in California, of course, there's an extended drought, and um, this is on all of our minds. How should people be thinking about this drought in the context of, of climate risks and uh, the global climate change challenge? Um, so I submitted revisions on a paper about this uh, about six hours ago. So, um, <laughs> so something, something we're working on now. Um, you know, I, th I think that, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard scientific problem. So we, you know, we often get asked, like, there's a thunderstorm over my head right now. Is this global warming or not? And, um, you know, it, there's, it, there's a lot of science that goes into trying to, trying to understand that. I think what I would say about the, about the current drought is that, you know, one of the key features of the drought is uh, extremely low snowpack. Uh, in in the Sierras, and you know, we're our our water resources in California are highly dependent on Sierra snowpack. Uh, we're entering into the the late spring and and summer with with extremely low snowpack, and this is exactly the kind of year that uh, we're likely to see with further global warming occurring more and more often. Um, that that. that uh, the, the dry season in California where we rely on, on snow melt, uh, we're likely to, to see more and more years that, that uh, we don't have that water supply in that natural reservoir of, of snowpack. Um, so I, you know, in, in terms of what the wildfire uh, year ends up looking like, what uh, the stresses on agriculture, the stresses on water availability for human consumption, just from the, from the snow part of that, uh, this is this is exactly the kind of year that um, our theoretical understanding and climate model uh, climate model experiments uh, tell us is is likely to occur more frequently with continued global warming. Go ahead. The um, Noah is more of an expert on this than I am, but I believe last year's rain in San Francisco was something like one sixth the normal rain and was the lowest on record. And that's a, a more extreme change than the climate models would predict. But when more and more places, like the Hurricane Sandy hitting New York, was more extreme uh, than other storms that had hit New York. And so uh, it, when there's an increase in these numbers of sort of record-breaking extremes that are not necessarily directly predicted by the models, it makes you wonder, you know, it, are the models under predicting what's going to happen, or is this some confluence of natural variability and climate change? Uh, yeah, I think the confluence of, of variability and change is really the challenge for, from a scientific standpoint, but also from a human decision-making standpoint, because you know, we, the climate system is noisy. We know that. It, you know, it, it gets light in the morning, and then it gets dark at night, and you know, it varies, varies within the day, and it varies season to season and year to year. We're very familiar with that. And you know, we've, been, we've been paying really close attention to the climate system for a few decades now. And that's a pretty short time period uh, relative to the variability. And so you know, now we're in a world where 
with you know, 24 hour cable news and, and social media where we're really paying a lot of attention and people are really you know, making that information available. Uh, so we, we're aware of, of natural disasters that are happening all over the world. And I think it, that, that highlights the um, kind of signal to noise problem. There is a lot of variability. We know there's a lot of variability. And we also know that um, global warming is, is affecting the likelihood of many different kinds of extremes. But I mean, regardless of what the climate science is, that these extreme events have a big influence on how people perceive climate and climate change. I know my mom, for example, lives New York, near New York City. And I can talk to my mom about statistics and so on. But when Hurricane Sandy came, you know, she's calling me up saying climate change is here. And, and, uh, anyway, let's just say it's a complicated issue of uh, when the science is unsettled, is how much of these events to attribute to climate change and how much is natural, uh, you know, how to say how these extreme events should figure into the political process. It's a difficult so question. Let me, let me build on that because uh, uh, I believe you've recently written on this topic in terms of there's a lot of, there's a, uh, a lot of talk out there that, you know, at some point, we'll get the big one. We'll get the big hurricane, the big Katrina, the big, the next Sandy that will flip things around. And um, I know you've so, sort of done some modeling to say, what's the likelihood of that happening? Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, there, the you know, climate. Uh, this is saying climate is what you expect, and weather is what you get. And and what the the if we run a climate model starting at the same initial conditions and with the same emissions that the, at a regional level, the weather can be very different for decades on end. And so we, let's say if you did a 40 realizations or you know, 40 simulations of the climate of the next few decades, that th there could be somewhere the United States is warming twice as much as the global average, somewhere it doesn't warm at all. And so while there's a, a sort of political uh, it might be some political motivation to take advantage of extreme events that if we base policy on extreme events, there's a danger that, well, maybe we won't see much warming in the next decade and then pretend, then people will think, oh, it's okay to admit more and we can end up in a worse state. And so as scientists, we like to see people base policy on science and not their local weather, but that's not the way human psychology necessarily works. So building on, building on this and what you said, Noah, you know, one thing that I've been focusing on recently and thinking about how we take in information. You know, we have a society that's increasingly focused on sort of the hyper-local and the hyper-now. And we have a lot of information about the hyper-local and hyper-now. And you guys have access to a lot of information as scientists of long-term trends. But when we make these decisions, when we're, we're managing the risks in San Francisco as a coastal city, um, how do we how do we integrate from a decision maker's point of view the kind of information that you're producing as scientists and this hyper-local and hyper-now? And I, and I know that there's some kind of a conversation, sort of the next phase of the IPCC, what role they play in that. Thinking about building this information decision maker's approach. Well, so I think for a lot of decisions that I hear about, um, you know, in the Palo Alto City Council or, you know, um, you know real, world, real world decisions at this local scale, um, a lot of those seem to be focused on you know, small spatial scales, local, maybe regional spatial scales, and the next few decades. And you know, one of the challenges, is, as, as Ken was, was alluding to in his, in his previous comment, is that this, this is kind of the most difficult um, combination of time and space scales to accurately predict the, the evolution of the climate system. And, um, you know, I think that from, from my perspective, I think we'll, you know, we'll make the most sort of um, durable decisions if we accept that and accept that we aren't, aren't going to know the exact outcome of every climate variable in every part of the world on every, on every, in every year of the future and figure out ways to build resilience uh, within the context of not knowing the exact answer. And I think that, you know, we, we, in the United States, for example, over the last decade, we've experienced more than 70 individual climate and weather disasters that have caused at least a billion dollars of damage each. 
and some of those like like Sandy and like like the um, California drought now, like the like the heat and drought in the central and northeastern U.S. in 2012. Th some of those are much more than one billion dollars. You know, they're 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 many billions of dollars. And what that tells me is that we are not optimally adapted to the climate that we have now. And and that the given that we experience so much stress from the climate system, there are a lot of opportunities for managing the risks of of climate extremes right now. And that uh, if we can find those areas that will both make us more resilient in the current climate and not make us worse off uh, in, in the face of climate change, then I think those are sort of win-win uh, or no, no regrets opportunities. This mismatch of time scales is very clear in the work that I do. We've been doing a study on what happens if we don't uh, if we fail to transform our energy system and we continue uh, emitting uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. And uh, it looks like we could emit enough, uh, there are enough fossil fuels in the ground to melt most of Antarctica. And so Antarctica, if it melts completely, is something like 200 feet of sea level rise. But, but the idea that it might be 100, say 100 feet of sea level rise, but over many thousands of years. And so it's one thing to tell a policymaker, oh, the ocean's going to rise two or three feet this century. But to say, well, it's going to rise two or three feet every century for the next few thousand years, uh, you know, that, that means that a lot of, uh, that, that's a lot of retreat. It's not just building, uh, uh, building a dike or something. It's, it's, it's planning for long-term retreat. And how society deals with that, it's, it's a kind of issue that we've never dealt with before because we've never had the ability to, to, to look so far into the future. So, so that brings up a good point, and I, I'd like to switch now to sort of thinking about what, what do we do with this information. Um, uh, science is, is a really important uh, tool for understanding what's happening in the, for the Earth and to understand potential options. But, but how do we know, uh, what role does science play in telling us, you know, what, what we should do versus what we could do? Um, what I'm getting here at the sort of what role does science play and when do, where do values come in? How do we know what is too much? And how do we, as scientists, engage with policymakers in society to communicate that? Um, well, so I have the experience often of other people being frustrated with my answer to this question. Uh, so ready yourself. Um, <laughs> you know, I... I I think it's important for me personally as a scientist never to tell anyone that they should do anything. Uh, I think that you know we're we're trying to figure out how the world works. That's a it's pretty hard to do. You know, we, for me anyways, for someone that's more talented, it's less hard. But for me, you know, I spend all all my time when I'm not with my kids, you know, trying to figure out you know these little climate questions, and that's a full time job. Um, and I think you know we need we really need somebody at the table some ones at the table that are just trying to figure out the climate system. And I think the, the what to do and how to do it are really, there are experts in, in those areas that, you know, I, I think it's very critical that we as scientists engage with people who are making real decisions. Um, it, you know, it's important for society, it's important, uh, you know, I'm, I'm funded by, by the public, you know, much of my research is funded by the public, so I feel like I have a responsibility to communicate with the public. But I, I'm very, I have a very hard boundary in my communication that I, I will never say should. Um, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to say, well, you know, this is our understanding of the way, way the world works, you know, suggests these are the odds in this direction or these are the odds in that direction. But I think that uh, it's really important that people who understand how to make policy are the ones deciding what the policy should be, and, and likewise for behavior and, and other areas. Mm -hmm. Ken, you want to jump in? Yeah, I have a slightly different perspective on this in that I agree that the role of the scientist is to establish empirical facts and not uh, present their personal values as facts. I do think it's sensible to have personal values drive what questions you ask. So this question of what, what will happen if we continue using this guy as a waste dump for greenhouse gas pollution, that question is driven by values, but my answer 
I make every effort to be as objective as possible. Uh, I, you know, if we had uh, two hats here, I could put on different hats. I, I, I look at myself as I have my scientist hat in which I say empirical, hopefully true sentences, and then I have my informed citizen hat where I say what I think we should do as an informed citizen. And so when I say, oh, we should stop using the sky as a waste dump for greenhouse gas pollution, I'm happy to say that. But I say that as a citizen and not as a scientist. Mm -hmm. That's important. Um, so, so Ken, you've been engaged in your research um, on what some would uh, consider a science fiction approach to uh, this challenge of global warming geoengineering the atmosphere to change the energy balance of the Earth. I guess I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about, one, um, you know, do you actually see that as a viable solution? And two, in the context of this values judgment, um, as balancing those two hats, when would, what would be the moment which where you would say, yes, we should do this? So this question relates to the previous question because my original intent uh, in starting to uh, research geoengineering, and this is the idea that, that yeah, yeah, so the, you can think of greenhouse gases as a sort of like a blanket that helps, uh, that makes it more difficult for heat to escape from Earth to space. And the uh, sunlight is what's heating up the Earth to begin with. And so one way of cooling down the Earth, you know, one way would be to take the blankets off or at least stop putting more blankets on. But the other would be to, uh, you know, to, to have less sunlight absorbed by the Earth and, and heat things up not so quickly. And I had first heard about this idea in 1998. And my, originally, I thought it was a crazy idea. And I did a bunch of uh, climate model simulations trying to show that the idea wouldn't work. And unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, the, but, the, <laughs> but the climate model said, well, it basically would work. And so we published that result, uh, which my personal values would have been to say that it wouldn't work. Since then, there's been uh, a substantial amount of research in this area. And it looks like uh, we could or we, meaning society as a whole, could put aerosols in, in the stratosphere, and this is little tiny particles, uh, and to reflect some sunlight. And there was a volcano in 1991 that did this Mount Pinatubo, and the Earth cooled the next year despite the increase in greenhouse gas concentration. And it looks like it would be technically feasible to fly airplanes around high in the sky, spraying little particles out and cool the earth and prevent warming for this rest of this century. And I mean, obviously, that's extremely risky. And uh, what are some of the risks? That well, we there, I, mean, the, I mean, there's two kinds of risks. There's environmental risks. A, it could just not work. And you could accidentally destroy the ozone layer or do who knows <laughs> what. Uh, you know, you know, you know it's some minor problem like that. Or you know the other kind of risks are the socio-political risks, like maybe one country's doing it and that's making another country worse off, and they might decide that it's worth going to war over, and then you have all kinds of geopolitical conflict. And so there's both sort of, and then there's this sort of social dynamic of if people feel like, oh well, this technical solution's working, we don't have to worry about emissions reduction, mm -hmm. and so you can wind up with more greenhouse gases. So there's no shortage of downsides. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that always scared me about this as an option is that you could actually have a change in the temperature very quickly. Yeah. So it's, it gives you a, in our world of instant gratification, there's sort of a nice path to that, which is a scary, scary thing to me. The models project that if we continue our current trends in greenhouse gas emissions, that in the tropics, almost every summer will be hotter than the hottest summer yet experienced. And even on normal summers, there are a lot of tropical crops that are heat stressed. And I, I'm not saying this is likely, but it's possible that there could be widespread crop failures and massive famines and things like that. And you know, if it really, it could come to a point where there's a potential to save hundreds of millions of lives by doing something like this. But there's also other ways to save hundreds of millions of lives. So it's not your only choice. And the other thing is that it might not be countries like the United States 
that we'd initiated might be the tropical countries themselves saying we need to cool things off, or maybe even just using it as a threat, saying, look, if you don't give us food aid, we'll do this. So um, I'm going to weave in questions from the audience now, um, building on, on where, we, where we just left off with the geoengineering challenge. Um, you know, when I, when I think about geoengineering as a challenge in terms of, you know, there's this prospect that you could change things really quickly and address things quickly, which is a good thing, but then you think about the global uh, difficulties we have been having in terms of an agreement about greenhouse gas emissions, and then you think, how are we going to ever come to an agreement to, to managing something like geoengineering? Um, and so what I want to do is switch to not a global solution, but local efforts. Um, there's, there are a lot of, increasingly, a lot of, sort of bottom-up local cities, communities, um, companies, universities that are, are taking on this issue uh, by themselves and um, not waiting for a global or national solution. Um, so I, a two-part question. One is just understanding what is your um, thoughts in terms of the ability for these local efforts to have uh, a global impact. Uh, and these are important efforts. I think they're important politically. Uh, but my question is from a con the context of, of the climate system. Um, let me start there, and I'll ask the second question after. Noah, do you want to? Yes, I think um, if we think about what the climate research community calls mitigation, which is um, you know, reducing, essentially reducing emissions of greenhouse gases or managing emissions of greenhouse gases. There's very little that one country can do to just single-handedly to alter the, the trajectory of the global climate system. Just, I mean, if pick any one country, even the United States, um, you know, which is 25% of historical carbon dioxide emissions, even the United States going to zero emissions, just the, the arithmetic of, of the, you know, the global energy system is such that we alone in the United States can't alter the, the trajectory of global warming individually. Um, if we talk about something like geoengineering, like, like Ken was just talking about, it's, it's kind of flipped that, you know, as, as Ken was saying, an individual country can, can act alone uh, and, and put enough sulfate aerosol into the atmosphere and mimic enough uh, Pinatubo-like uh, volcanoes to alter, individually alter the, the global energy balance. So I think that's a, that's a, a tension that the, that the international, you know, here at the World, World Affairs Council, the international um, dynamics of mitigation versus geoengineering are, are somewhat different, and Ken has, Ken's thought a lot about this. Um, in terms of adaptation or you know, risk management, that's where the local scales really can, you know, there, there's a lot of leverage at the local scales, because ultimately, we were impacted by the climate system at, at local and regional scales. And so uh, in terms of um, becoming less vulnerable to the climate system that we have now, in terms of dealing with uh, the climate change that's you know, baked into the system, as, as uh, some people put it, uh, because of climate system inertia, uh, those are, I think, as I was saying earlier, there are a lot of opportunities for win-win, no regret type decisions that um, really we have jurisdiction over at the, at the local scale and can be very effective. So I guess that, that's a general answer. I think that the, um, you know, the scale of the global energy challenge, uh, you know, in terms of the benefits of energy consumption, the scale of that is so great that it's a given um, that we are going to face more climate change. We're already experiencing impacts right here, right now, from the global warming that's already happened. We're going to experience more global warming, and that's where I think the local scales really, really come in. Can I twist the question to you a little bit, and you can answer the full thing? Okay. So, um, so in the context of um, of the one one area that I've had a lot of conversations with folks um, recently in terms of an avenue for scaling up uh, city efforts is um, adding to the standard approach of assessing what is the emissions that a city makes inside its city versus the, the emissions that are contributed from the consumption that, that's, that the population in that city has. So um, 
uh, that if you took the consumption base approach, that you could actually have a larger global impact potentially uh, by not having what is called leakage, and I'll let you explain that, and other challenges. Um, and I know you've written a lot on the, this shift to a consumption-based approach and the opportunities there, and maybe you can comment uh, on that as an opportunity. Okay, there's like seven, seven points and questions <laughs> there, but let, let, let me um, start with the original question okay. you asked, Noah. And, and that, you know, every little bit is good, but little bits are just little bits, and we need to do a lot if this problem is going to be resolved. But uh, historically, there's been an attempt to use a treaty process, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that uh, most observers would think hasn't been overwhelmingly successful. A and so this idea that maybe through establishment of norms and leadership and so on, that progress could be made, uh, at least it's worth trying. There, there's a portfolio of approaches. There's no reason to abandon a treaty-based approach, but maybe supplement it with this other approach. And I think if we look at the recent EPA, rules, you know, had California not taken leadership and established uh, some controls on greenhouse gas emissions, you know, would, it's on, I, I would say, my, I, I would be surprised then if EPA would have done what they ha had done. And uh, another kind of concrete example of norms on a kind of lower level is, you know, I, today I drove here with a car that had a tailpipe that was releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And if all my friends were driving electric cars, I would feel kind of embarrassed to do that. And, and, and so I think on a personal level, the more people around us are avoiding emissions, the more we'll avoid emissions. And then I think the more countries that are seriously avoiding emissions, it'll kind of set up a norm that if you want to be considered a player in the international community, there are certain standards that you need to abide by. So I, I think there is potential for an informal approach. And, I, and so you raised the issue of uh, consumption-based accounting. And this idea about, if we look at China's emissions, for example, around 20% of their greenhouse gas emissions are going into producing goods for export that might be consumed here or in Europe or in other places. And so, uh, at least this, so one way of asking the question how much emissions are we responsible for is to include the emissions that were needed to make all the products that we're consuming. If we think of a city like San Francisco, where most of the products we consume are not made here but are brought in, that, that to just look at the emissions coming out of the city of San Francisco is not really giving a good uh, picture of the emissions from uh, th that the citizens of San Francisco are causing. And insofar as, say, San Francisco could institute policies that would encourage people in other places to produce goods that would have lo lower emissions uh, associated with their production, then that, that would be, a, I would think, a good thing. And so this consumption-based accounting does give uh, a way to put pressure on other localities to produce things with lower greenhouse gas emissions. And do you think it's a promising avenue? Uh, I, I'm a big fan of a portfolio approach and uh, you know, try a bunch right. of things and see what works. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. I just want to add, um, I don't want to be a downer about the U.S. not being able to single-handedly alter the, the trajectory of global temperature. I think that you know, what Ken was saying about not only about the sort of peer pressure aspect, but also just the innovation. I think you know, that's where in terms of in terms of emissions, and, you know, energy technology, uh, the policies that figuring out which policies work and don't work, figuring out uh, where you know efficiencies, you know, low-hanging fruit can be can be harvested. Um, you know, the, if if the world is going to ensure access to the benefits of energy consumption globally, um, you know, that's if we do it the way the U.S. has done it, if we do it the way I've I've individually done it, that's a lot of carbon emissions. And so it's not just, in addition to the peer pressure part of it, uh, there's the actual innovation you know, in, in terms of technology and policy and everything else. And that's where I think, again, at the local scale, whether it's the city, whether it's the state, whether it's, whether it's the country, where we have a real opportunity to, to imp impact the world. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point. I mean, I think I find the, pick, the problem is so huge that if you, we just focus on just the end point rather than the trajectory, getting on the trajectory to the end point, we can, we can get to 
disheartened by the challenge in front of us. Let me uh, go to a, a question that goes back to um, the core science here of the climate system, and, and I'm going to read this one directly. If all the various weather events are noise and can't directly be related to climate change, how is it that you are so confident climate change is upon us? What we experience day to day is that is the noise. I mean, it's, it's the noise in this um, complex coupled ocean atmosphere land system. Um, and it's really the, you know, the, the energy balance and really the spatial imbalance of energy on the planet that's creating that atmosphere and ocean circulation. And then we experience it as weather. Um, but we know that ultimately that's, a, that's an outcome of the energy in the climate system. As Ken was saying, you have the energy coming in from the sun. You have the greenhouse gases that are acting like a blanket. And we're, we're altering the energy balance by uh, emitting greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And one of the ways that we know that, um, that global warming is, is influencing extreme events uh, is you know, we, can, uh, we can directly measure uh, the temperature. We can, we can measure the sea level. We can measure the rainfall. Uh, and so we, we can analyze those long-term records. And that's, kind of, that's called the detection part of the, of the problem uh, in, in the jargon. And then in the attribution part, um, you know, we, a lot of our work is focused on trying to understand whether or not the global warming that's already happened has influenced the likelihood of these extreme events. Um, and we actually, we know, for example, for, for Sandy that was discussed earlier, that was a really complex storm. Uh, the, the actual, what made the storm happen was really complex. It was really rare. But a big reason that there was so much damage was the, uh, the flooding, the storm surge flooding. And when scientists look at the sea level rise that's already happened historically, uh, and they calculate that the likelihood of that extreme storm surge, say at, at Battery Park in New York, uh, is almost twice as likely because of the sea level rise that's already happened than if the same storm had occurred without the sea level rise. So there's one example where even though that there's a lot of noise causing Sandy, the sea level rise has already essentially doubled the risk of that level of flooding. Likewise, for uh, severe heat in, in the United States, we, you know, for, through similar sorts of scientific methods, we've calculated that the likelihood of the, um, for the summer of 2012, which was on the order of a, of a $10 billion um, extreme event in terms of the damages, that that level of heat is about four times as likely in the current climate than if there hadn't been the human emissions. So even though that's, it's the noise that's causing the extreme, the likelihood of exceeding these thresholds is, uh, is affected by global warming. Right. Also, I mean, we know that Venus is hot. I mean, it's closer to the sun, but it's also hot because it has a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. And we know that a major reason why Mars is cold is because it doesn't have much of an atmosphere. The, the dark side of the moon is the same distance from the sun as we are. And, and it's frigid on the dark side of the moon because there's no atmosphere holding the heat in. And over 150 years ago, Foyer understood that the nights would be terribly cold and there must be a blanket keeping the heat in the Earth at night. And so the basic science of climate change and has roots going back nearly two centuries. And it's been, at least for a half century, pretty well understood. And yes, there's weather fluctuations on top of it. But, but in order for basic physics of global warming to be wrong, you know, it's like uh, you know, you'd have to come up with a whole new science to explain many, many things. It's, I, I wouldn't know. It would be really tough to create well, would you a. Call it? it would <laughs> well, I would call. It, but it would it would be like you know it would be like creating like you know it would, I'd call it like creation science or something like that. You'd have to create an alternate scientific universe. Anyway, but which some people do. <laughs> um. 
So that, that leads into to my next question, um, which I'll read directly, which is, can you speak to the issues and uncertainties around positive feedbacks and tipping points um, in not the alternate universe, but our universe? I'm actually less of a tipping point. You know, some scientists are concerned about tipping points. And I don't want to say that they're <laughs> impossible. I think let's talk, talk about different kinds of tipping points. I think that there are social tipping points when society reaches a critical, you know, critical mass, uh, reach a certain viewpoint, and then society changes how it views things. But most of the climate system tends to be pretty linear in the sense that if you increase the CO2 emissions, the amount of climate change increases. If you decrease it, it decreases. And there are some tipping points with ice sheet uh, collapses and so on. And, so, and also, obviously, species extinction is a tipping point, because once a species is extinct, you're not coming back. But, and you know, people talk about, as a tipping point, say, methane pouring out of Siberia. And, and you know, I think that some methane may come out, and it may be an amplifier. But the probability that the Earth is really going to go off into a complete sort of runaway greenhouse or something like this, I don't think it is a major well, let me threat. Let me elaborate on that, though, because um, I'm surprised to hear you say in general tip on the tipping points, because, I mean, certainly ecological systems have thresholds by which we see nonlinear changes in the system. And um, so I want to make sure we distinguish yeah. between the fact that the ecological systems don't gradually change over time yeah. in a general pattern. And then the other thing is positive feedbacks. I mean, I think an important thing to touch on in the positive feedbacks piece is, um, I mean, that, that also seems like a pretty important part of understanding our ecological system. I mean, I, I, I think it's true that one of the reasons there's so much uncertainty in the projections of the climate system in terms of warming is, in fact, the feedbacks of the water system, which are a great uncertainty. So there are feedbacks and tipping points that... Yeah. Let me just say that I spend, I, I don't want to present an overly rosy picture here, but the, I mean, I do, uh, one of the things I do is study effects of climate change and more, more centrally uh, ocean acidification on coral reef systems. Mm -hmm. And I, if current emission trends continue, I think within a half century, there won't be any sustainable coral reef left on the planet. And, and so, uh, and for individual reefs, there might be a tipping point where that reef dies. Mm -hmm. But if you have thousands of reefs, and probably each week two reefs are dying, that in a way, it, this is kind of, you could think of that as thousands of little tipping points that we're crossing, a couple of them every week. Mm -hmm. Or you could just look at it as kind of a progressive degradation that leaves in this destroyed ecosystem type. So my rosy picture of not tipping points is, oh, we're just sort of gradually, or not gradually, but sort of progressively mm -hmm. destroying things. But it's not, so but that's gradual change is yeah, okay, as yeah, long as well, it's gradual. Not, but it's gradual, <laughs> no, it's not much fast. Like but, but I think it's this thing of climate, there's two different issues. There's this issue of climate feedback. Yeah. Killing the reefs is doesn't necessarily cause more climate change, or maybe. Wait, wait, wait. Right. So I think part of the challenge in discussing tipping points is that just the word tipping point gets used in a bunch of different ways. Yeah. And I, I think the, the two issues really that you brought up that I heard were uh, feedbacks and thresholds. And sometimes there are thresholds beyond which a feedback mm -hmm. is initiated. Um, so there are a lot of examples of really important thresholds. And uh, you know one where, one where um, corals can, you know, calcify or not on either side of that threshold, that's a really important threshold. And I think arguing, a lot of the time there's an argument about is it a real tipping point or not, and um, that can be a technical discussion. But, but certainly the, the, the freezing point of water is a really important threshold, and it's one that we understand pretty well. And you know, for here in, in California, for example, with, with snow and our reliance on on the natural reservoir of snow, you know, if if the atmosphere warms enough that uh, you know, precipitation comes as rain rather than snow, or if the snow that it that that does fall at high elevations melts earlier in the year, you know, that threshold of passing that 
melting point has real implications for our water resources here in the West, for the infrastructure, for the management. And that's, so, so that's an important threshold. I think that the you know, species extinction, as Ken mentioned, that's, that's a real threshold. Like it's, and in fact, is a tipping point in that you can't, if you say, oh, that species went extinct, let's lower back down to 350 parts per million. Well, the, the species still extinct for the, you know, as far as we know. Um, I think with extinction, that's, that's a really critical threshold. The other one, um, again, here, here at the World Affairs Council, is the I issue of sea level, and not just the kinds of risk of extreme storm surge that we've been talking about tonight, but the existential issue of sea level causing all of the land of a country to no longer be above water because sea level rises. And you know, what does that mean that for a country that used to have geographic area above sea level used to have land and then no longer does. There are huge um, implications you know, for, for those people and also for internationally. Um, and so that's a, real, that's a real threshold that you know, the sort of above sea level or you know, below sea level or above sea level, that, that's, a real, that's a real threshold that has, has real implications. So one of the one of the topics that was got a lot of attention in the uh, recent IPCC report was food security. And we have a question here. What are your thoughts on the impact of climate change on food security? And what is being done to address this particular issue? Noah, do you want to? Well, so with agriculture, you know, that's, that's a domain where uh, people have been paying a lot of attention to the climate for a long time. So we, have, we actually have some really long records of people paying really close attention to what's going on in the sky right where they're growing their food and, and keeping track of what happens with their food, uh, you know, with their crops um, as the climate varies. So it's an area where we understand for a lot of different crops what the, um, what the relationship with climate is. And, and you know, one of the areas where we've had a lot of research over the last five, six, seven years is in how, um, again, the extremes of, of particularly temperature uh, impact uh, various crops such as corn, uh, premium wine grapes, cotton, soybeans, wheat, and you know it, it's there's there's a lot of evidence now that that uh, these crops do have real thresholds. They're thresholds that were uh, identified in the lab a long time ago, but now when people use these uh, these big data techniques to look at uh, huge huge data sets of of the climate system and uh, crop yields it becomes very clear that there are some really important nonlinear effects with increasing temperature, and this is something where I think I think crops is is an area where in particular the two degrees Celsius target that's been agreed upon by the the international community. Uh, we, you know, I often hear that well scientists have said that two degrees is the safe limit, and cr you know, crop sensitivity to extreme temperature is you know is is one of the prime examples that we know that we will still have impacts even at two degrees. We know that the, that the level of, you know, the, the occurrence of severe heat, even from another degree of, of global warming beyond what we've already experienced, uh, has the potential to really change uh, the, the temperature envelope of, of some of the really important uh, crop growing regions. That doesn't mean there aren't, there's not potential for adaptation, but all things being equal, uh, there's a lot of vulnerability of, of uh, corn and, and other important crops. Do just to say that um, some projections of future crop yields project decreased yields in the tropics due to heat stress, but there's some potential for increased yields in the northern mid-latitudes as growing seasons get longer and uh, maybe increased precipitation and warmth. And, and so this, uh, you know, again, obviously sets up some geopolitical consequences if you have the people who were responsible for emitting most of the carbon dioxide and their crops are doing well and the poorer parts of the world are suffering. And, and the, uh, and, you know, this comes, brings up the question of, so there might be enough food globally, but will it be distributed mm -hmm. in a way? And, you know, we haven't, been very good about these equity issues in the past, mm -hmm. and so are we going to get better in the future? Is uh, important question. Important question. Yeah. The um, and and uh, you know I I think the 2008 subprime mortgage 
crisis, the financial crisis is a good illustrative example because there, there was nothing physical that changed. Just a few million people realized that their house mortgage was more than their house was worth and so they stopped paying and through credit default swaps and all this, you lost 5% of GDP globally. And so one of the questions with climate change is, you know, since climate change is going to be felt, except for maybe sea level change, mostly felt locally, right? There's a sandy, there's a drought. And you know, will our economic and political and social systems kind of keep that as some kind of regional crisis and maybe address that? Or are these local and regional crises going to be propagated through economic or military or political mechanisms to be some kind of global crisis? So, uh, you know, I don't see us becoming lots more resilient after the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis, and, but I would think that just a general resilience of our economic and political systems yeah. would be a useful thing to work on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point that the idea that increasingly it's not just you raise a question whether local issues will influence global security, global resilience, but in fact, we're already seeing that, right? I mean, Sandy disrupted the financial, global financial system, the floods in Thailand influence the supply chains of different products. I mean, I think increasingly we will be, we already are seeing uh, the effect that local disasters, weather disasters, do have a global um, footprint and a global kind of challenge. And that, what that raises to me is, you know, we, we address climate change, we're, we're really good at solving very focused problems, carbon. CO2, uh, but really climate change as it moves from just a CO2 problem to a global challenge of managing the risks that are already underway, it's, a, it's, a, the, it's the risk of systemic failure. Um, and what role do you think science plays in trying to support the systemic risks that we face in this, in this realm? Sort of the, the challenges that you lay out. but. I mean, this is not so much a physical science research problem, but I, I think from a social science research, this question of how do we develop economic and political systems that are more robust and resilient and don't, you know, you don't have things like credit default swaps mm -hmm. amplifying things and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's, but but uh, you know, it seems to be a pretty central issue yeah. that people need to be working on. So I, I think with these, the example you gave, uh, Amy, of weather disasters. I mean, I think there's there's some really clear first steps that that science has an important role in, and you know, we're we're making a lot of decisions based on, uh, you know, societally, we're making a lot of a lot of decisions based on long-term records of of temperature and, and rainfall and winds. And, uh, and basically, you know, a lot of cases assuming that that's the climate we're in now. We can look back 50 or 100 years and take the statistics of that record as being the climate that we're in now. But we have a lot of evidence that, that the odds of those kinds of extremes have already changed uh, because of the global warming that's already happened. And actually, we're, you know, in a lot of cases, if we just assume stationarity, you know, in terms of how you know, infrastructure decisions are made, how management decisions are made, then we, we're, we're, we'll be designing systems that, that don't even consider the odds of those events. You want to explain the, stationarity? Uh, yeah, so essentially that, 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 the, uh, that the time series hasn't changed. But I mean, if you think about the, um, if you think about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right, it bounces up and down day to day and quarter to quarter and year to year, but it's also had a, it's had a long-term trend. And, you know, the odds of, of um, I have absolutely no idea what the what the value of the Dow is today, but I mean, let's say the odds of Ken might know um, <laughs> the uh, the odds of uh, of you know Dow eleven thousand or Dow twelve thousand. Right? I mean, they're, they're much higher now than they were in in 1950 because of you know because of economic growth that's created this this trend. And so the Dow um, is a stationary. That's your main point, right? That's my main point, and <laughs> and I don't under, that's that that's I understand very little about the stock market. <laughs> the, point, the point is that I think if, we, if someone's making a dam right now, they're designing a dam right now, uh, or they're designing a, a levee right now, 
there's some hard, challenging science to be done to figure out what the likelihood of a Category 5 hurricane is yeah. in that location or what the category of a storm surge of, of you know, X feet is in, in the climate that we have now. I don't think we can, scientifically, we can rely on just on the long-term records. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, just to say that for the U.S. economy, I think 3% of our GDP or something, something about that is generated in the agricultural sector, whereas if you look at Bangladesh, something like 60% of their GDP is generated in the agricultural sector. And so a place like Bangladesh is much more vulnerable to changes in the weather or changes in the climate than we are. And you know, the, the sort of game, and Tom Schelling makes this point, the Nobel Prize winning economist, that, that it's rational for the Bangladeshis to try to industrialize as rapidly as possible on higher ground to try to bring more of their economy indoors and make themselves less vulnerable to climate change. But if they do that using existing technologies, they're going to exacerbate the global scale problem. And so, and I think this is back to this issue of innovation and getting cheaper energy technologies so that when places like Bangladesh see a need to industrialize, which they do already, that they you can do it in a way that doesn't exacerbate the global problem. So we're, we're coming to an end to our radio portion. We will have a, uh, some time to ask a few questions afterwards. But um, as we, we conclude that session, I want to ask one more question for, um, for each of you. Uh, and this is uh, drawing a bit from the discussion here from we've gotten here. So. Um, Noah, what, what keeps you up at night? Lately, it's been the California drought. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, I think, you know, as scientists, we, we're really lucky in that you know, society, you, know, you all have given us the opportunity to try to figure out how the world works and spend our time, um, you, know, you know, yeah, trying to figure out this, this big puzzle. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity so thank you um, so yeah I'm, I mean I'm when I'm up at night it, you know I'm I, most of my research questions are informed by um, you know the impacts of, of the climate system on on humans and on other living things and trying to understand that interface trying to understand what it is that makes heat waves and what it is that makes tornadoes and and how how global warming affects those those physical events because we know that that we're vulnerable to them um, you know we, we see that we see that every day um, and so that I'd, I'd say those are you know trying to understand understand that that interface is is what keeps me up at night great thank you for your work um, and Ken uh, what gives you hope I hope I was getting ready to answer that question. <laughs> 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 Got to keep it on yeah, your toes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess there's a few things. One is that I do think that there's great potential for technological innovation. And the other thing is I, I think that human, that, that societies can undergo phase changes. I, I, while I'm skeptical about tipping points with the physical climate system and social systems, uh, I'm a believer, and I, I think that uh, you know that with measures like the EPA, what California is doing, all these little measures, that I do think that we could come to this point where there is this tipping point where it's just considered the right thing to do, and people do it. So. That's a that's a great and note to end on. I think we we will be approaching a social tempo point. I'm I'm very optimistic that we will address this 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 challenge. So that concludes our radio portion um, of the evening tonight at the World Affairs Council. Thank you, um, Ken and Noah, for joining us in this excellent discussion.